Before we read, let's remember that what we're about to read is God's authoritative, sufficient, perfect word, complete, without any deficiencies, and capable of transforming us every time we come to it with faith. Let's read Acts 9, verse 32. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Well, last week, there was a solar eclipse, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> it packed the news cycle for, it seemed like weeks, certainly the last few days before the eclipse. People were very excited about it, even in Round Rock, people were excited about it. I, I know people were, were traveling to go see. It's a very unusual occurrence, obviously, the moon passing in front of the sun uh, to such a degree that at least in our country, there was a near total eclipse in certain areas. And I think part of the fascination, which you can understand, was it's so unusual. I've heard one person say it, it might be 35 years before you might be this close to a total eclipse again. Uh, it's a long time. And so you don't get to see it maybe once, maybe twice in your lifetime that you might see this, unless you're willing to travel to other parts of the world or something. Very unusual. It's an unusual occurrence. It's, it breaks the ordinary routine. When we were uh, at our pool when the eclipse occurred, and I, I thought the, the eclipse was greatly exaggerated in terms of how the effect was going to be actually in Round Rock. I kept saying, surely it's, it's, it's going to be more than it is right now. <laughs> surely there's going to be more that we're going to see. I kept thinking, I, I don't... I, 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 th I think it's getting darker, maybe. I hope it's, surely it's getting darker. But then a whole group of moms and their children came to the pool and they had a homemade uh, eclipse viewing kits with cereal boxes and tin foil. And, and so they were all out there at the pool kind of gazing, angling these boxes. And I thought, man, if nobody knew about the eclipse, this would be a strange thing to see. People with, you know, lucky charms, plastered to their faces and they got tinfoil and they're, they're tilting it all different which ways and yes, yes, you know, I saw it. So we joined in the fun and we went over and joined them looking as odd as we possibly could and looked into their cereal boxes and sure enough, there was a little dot and there was the little moon coming over the little dot right there in the box and it was, it was wonderful fun. Great fun. I thought, you know, it's, it's interesting how an eclipse captures our attention because it's unusual. It's extraordinary. 
It breaks in and kind of captivates our imagination for a moment. And certainly for those people that were in more of the full eclipse, it, it, it brought them outside. I got pictures from family members that were outside and, and it was dark and you're seeing the stars and you're, 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 you're just seeing something you never see any other time. Well, this story is meant to capture our attention not simply because it's unusual or rare. It's supposed to be capturing our attention for, for a greater reason than that. This moment in this story, like many moments throughout the Bible, it, it's not simply unusual. It's not simply extraordinary. It is impossible. It is impossible in the natural world. It is supernatural. The eclipse is natural but unusual, and it captivated the imagination of the country for weeks. This is not unusual. It is impossible. It is supernatural, and it's intending to capture our attention for a very specific purpose. It's supposed to do something. It's supposed to get something done. After the eclipse, very little was left over except a massive amount of pictures of the sun on iPhones and a lot of useless glasses. Very little impact was had other than a, a, a memory and where were you when kind of conversations. But this passage and this supernatural event is supposed to change us. It's supposed to have an impact on us. Luke wrote this down to affect not just a moment in time, but the rest of our lives. Now, this passage breaks down into sort of a two-part act. There's two miracles, and they progress. They crescendo. The event increases along the way. There's, there's two explosions of power, and they're both intending to make a very important point. First, power over paralysis, and then power over death. Power over paralysis, power over death. First, this man that Peter meets as he's traveling around called Aeneas. You see there in verse 32, Peter apparently is ministering among the saints as the gospel has expanded beyond Jerusalem. Lydda, this community would have been toward the shore, which is very important in Acts. The gospel continues to move outward from Jerusalem. And in some ways, this two-part miracle story sets up chapter 10 when the gospel explodes into the Gentile world through a man named Cornelius as Peter interacts with him. But Peter is on his way there, and he finds this man, apparently a, a believer, we think, named Aeneas, who's been bedridden for eight years because he is paralyzed. Now, if we're going to feel this story, I've mentioned this before, in narratives, we, we need to first experience it as a story. Narratives don't work quite the same way the letters of Paul do. You're not looking in every sentence for a new pithy moralism. You first have to just feel the story. Just put yourself there in this time, in this season of history, and feel the story. So this man who has been bedridden for eight years is supposed to draw our attention and our sympathy, our compassion. And really, any era of history has people like this. Maybe it wouldn't be this particular type of paralysis, but even today, there's people that are paralyzed that even modern medicine can't cure. And this man, apparently healthy at one point, has spent eight years imprisoned in his own bed. He is powerless to protect himself, probably to provide for himself. He is without any natural hope. The natural order of things says that this man will be bound to his bed forever. He is hopeless and desperate and not able to move. He is in a, a prison of sorts. This man, Aeneas. And the community is powerless to help him in the natural. It's not as though this apparently is a bad man or an evil man. It seems that he's among the disciples there. But he's hopeless and helpless physically. Nothing in the natural order of things, nothing even unusual can help this man. It's been too long. It's been eight years. And then Peter arrives on the scene. 
Peter says to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. In a moment, there's an eclipse of sorts. There's an eclipse of the natural order of things and the blazing hope of a supernatural power comes in to this man's life. And you notice Luke's insistence on the power that was present. Notice it says, he, and immediately he rose. Immediately he rose. Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. Now, why does Luke write about this? Why, why does he put this here? Well, he puts this here to reveal there is a supernatural savior. There is a savior that is outside the bounds of the normal, natural progression of life. There is a savior who can set people free from their prison of paralysis. There is a savior who is not bound by the confines of the medical community. There is a savior that no longer how long it's been that a person is bound in this way, Jesus Christ can set them free and release them. And the point of this miracle is not that every Christian will always be healed or that every Christian will never face sickness or that no good people will ever suffer. No, the point is that the revelation of this power causes people to turn their gaze to Jesus Christ. You notice it says, all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. They saw Aeneas and they turned to the Lord. The point is not just a fascination with a medical miracle. The point is turning to the source of that miracle and saying, there is someone with supernatural power. Now, it's important. This is probably several years after the events at Pentecost. Peter has been ministering for several years now, and it's possible, and certainly the perhaps 30 years, 35 years later when Luke is writing this, that people who had heard the story of Jesus were struggling with doubt. It, it, it's hard to believe that a carpenter from Nazareth was God the Son the one crucified on a cross actually rose from the dead. Isn't it possible this is all just a new version of Judaism and it's just a new version of a religious way of getting to God? Isn't it possible that that's, that's really what's going on here and a kind of naturalistic doubt begins to creep in to the community? And so Luke writes down the story of Aeneas to point out, no, there is a power over the paralysis of a man who was in bed for eight years. The effect on these residents is intended by Luke to be the same effect on us, on his original readers. There is someone who should capture your attention. There is someone who is actually supernatural, who is beyond the limits of natural limitations. His name is Jesus Christ. He heals you, Aeneas. Rise and pick up your bed. And all the people of the community see Aeneas standing who could not stand. They realize there is someone above and beyond the natural expectations of things. And they realize this person Peter represents must actually be the risen and ascended Lord. And therefore, we must put our trust in him. There's this power over the impossible, hopeless condition of a man imprisoned on his own bed for eight years. There is someone who can set that man free. And his name is Jesus. And he's living. And he's acting. And this gospel Peter's been proclaiming in this whole region must be true. And so the community as a whole, apparently a large number of them turn, it says, very important phrase, I think, turned to the Lord. They turned away from their natural assumptions. They turned away from their humdrum religious experience. They turned away from their presumptions that the world is the way it is. What will be, will be. And they turned to a supernatural savior that just revealed himself on a man who was eight years in bed, now standing and walking among them power over paralysis. But the two-part miracle story continues. Power over death. 
power over death. If you've ever seen, I, I, I know all of you have at some point, a, a fireworks show uh, where you're enjoying the initial show. And then there's this moment where it, there's this really imp- impressive burst of fireworks. And everybody says, I think, I think this is it. I think this is the finale. And that's kind of like part of the fun of the fireworks. As you say, I think, I think that was it because that was really impressive. A bunch of fireworks in a row and it was a big bright display and they did new and different ones. I think that was it. But that's just the preview. And then the real conclusion comes and you see the, all the fireworks go crazy. They start shooting them off in rapid succession. They're exploding all over the sky and you get the oohs and the ahs from the crowd and everybody goes nuts. That's the, that's the real conclusion. Well, that's a little bit the way this, this story works in the Bible. There's, there's two stories and they're intended to kind of build on each other. It's amazing enough that Aeneas is walking around. But it's as though Luke says, yeah, but they hadn't seen anything yet. They hadn't seen anything yet. If you think it's impressive that Jesus can raise up Aeneas, let me tell you about Tabitha. Nearby, there was a town called Joppa. Also important to note, Joppa was definitely Gentile territory. So the theological expansion in Acts is taking place. And a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. And in those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now, we want to notice right off the bat, if, we, if we've read the gospel stories, this should sound very familiar because Jesus was called and there was a person named Talitha and she also had died and she also was there receiving mourning and grief and Jesus also put everyone aside out from the room so that he could minister to her and then she was raised from the dead as as well. So already as you're reading the story, there should be this, this sense of deja vu. If you're, if you're a reader of the Bible, okay, then Jesus, Jesus was claimed to have done this once before. Very, very similar. The name is almost identical. And the upper room and the fact that Peter is now going to put them all out from her and, and he's going to pray. And there should be this sense, if you feel the drama of the story, there should be this growing sense of what, what's going to happen. Because another doubt could be, if you're a reader of Luke's book, Acts, and you're living 30 years after Jesus, that, well, I I know Jesus, you know, did amazing things when he was on earth, when he could actually see people and touch them. But it's, I mean, he's been gone 30 years. Is he still active? I mean, nobody has seen him. Are we sure this wasn't just some story that, that Peter told a bunch of people that wasn't actually true about Jesus? I mean, could there be a, a... a continued power of a person you can't see? Is he still that powerful? And so Peter and Luke, writing this, walks through an almost identical story to what Jesus did in the Gospels. And the accent here is on the fact that this good woman was deeply loved and cherished in her community. You notice the emphasis on she, she became ill and died, and then the, the disciples send to Peter. We, we, we don't know why, but perhaps they had some suspicion. Perhaps if anybody could do anything, perhaps, just maybe, the impossible is possible. J- just maybe. The only person we've ever heard of raising people from the dead is Jesus Christ. And, and Peter was Jesus' close friend, and he claims to represent Jesus. And even though Jesus has been gone for years now, per- perhaps, perhaps Jesus still exercises that power today. So they call for him. Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose, it says in 39, and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. And all the widows, again, feel the story. You're not supposed to read into this some kind of moralism. Everybody should always mourn in a certain way. But you are supposed to feel the grief of the story, the the sadness of the story. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Try to put yourself in the story. Imagine someone in your life that let's call them a pillar in your life. 
Let's say that you could, you could just point to thing after thing that they have done to serve you and encourage you and bless you. And they're sort of a pillar in terms of their, their impact on the Christian community. And, and, and God has used them in many powerful ways. And then suddenly you hear, oh, she got a diagnosis. It's cancer. And it's advanced. And, and she's declining fast. And the church prays, oh, not, not Tabitha, no, not her. They're praying for her and hoping, please, please let her not be taken. Don't you know the impact she's had on my life? But then the word goes out, she's gone. She's gone. And the grief begins and Somebody has faith enough to say, well, let's, let's call Peter. Y you never know. Perhaps, perhaps Peter can do something. Perhaps he can pray for her. Perhaps, and they, they bring Peter, and here he comes, and he's just overwhelmed and surrounded by these widows trying to point out, do you know the impact this woman had on my life? And death has taken her from us. Death has stolen from us this valuable Good, godly woman who is serving our community. Death has struck again. Death has come to Joppa. And I think as readers of the scriptures, we're supposed to feel the, the broader narrative here too. Death is that great enemy of sinners. Even those that are, that are saved in Jesus, there, there is still the, the physical reality of facing death. In this fallen world, death is present. And death had come to Joppa. Death had come to Joppa and taken something valuable from the church. And death in the natural world, in the natural progression of things, in the normal way things work, death is never reversed. And it's not just unusual for it to be reversed. It's never reversed. This woman had died. There was no hope of resuscitation. There was no hope of recovery. She was gone. Death had stolen her from this community. And here comes Peter. And Peter is, is literally reenacting the actions of his Lord. He puts them all outside the way Jesus did. There should be this growing dramatic tension. There's not some hidden message and only do miracles in secret. No, no, no. This is just supposed to be reenacting what Jesus did so that echoes of the power of Jesus should be reminding the readers and building them with anticipation about what's going to happen in this story. He prays, he turns to the body, and he says, Tabitha. Commentators point out there's a single letter different from the name of the girl that Jesus rose from the dead. Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And notice again, verse 42, the point. It became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Many believed in the Lord. So in Lydda and Sharon, they turned to the Lord. In Joppa, many believed in the Lord. Why did they do that? Why? Well, because something had eclipsed their natural assumptions about life. There was a Savior, and he was supernatural. And this was not just a man-made message. This was not just a religious system. This was a person who had divine power, who even had power over death, and could reverse its grip on this woman and raise her from the dead and present sent her back to this church as the pillow she'd always been. What's the point of this story? Everything Peter had said about Jesus was true, as evidenced by paralysis and death having no ability to stop him. There's only one kind of person that can raise someone from the dead, a supernatural person, a divine person, and Peter claims this person is Jesus Christ. What's the point? What's the point in all the details that are similar to what Jesus did? It's saying Jesus is still active, is still acting through his ambassador. He is still 
still displaying his supernatural power and inviting people to believe in him, to turn to him. Many, it says, many believed in the Lord. Again, the point of these stories is not, don't take narrative as a, a constant promise for all of life. It is not that, that every Christian who dies will be raised before they die again. No, that's not the point. The point is there is someone who has power over death. There is someone who can reverse the curse of the grave. There is someone who can reach into the grave and pull someone out again. There is someone and only one, and his name is Jesus. And it's meant to be a reverse eclipse. If we can keep pressing that analogy, where we live normally in the darkness of a kind of a naturalism and natural assumptions, and life just proceeds the way it always does and never changes. And here Peter comes to Lydda and Sharon and Joppa and says, no, there is a, a blazing, glorious son of heaven, and he has supernatural power over the things that you are captured by. And you should turn to him. You should trust in him. You should banish your doubt about him to the darkness and turn to him in faith and confidence. It's in intending to turn us to the Lord as well. The supernatural power of Jesus compels us it compelled the people in these communities. It was intended to compel the reader of Luke's book, Acts. It's compelling us this morning to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, to trust in him, to actively trust in him, to passionately trust in him. There's a sense of revival about these stories, that these communities realized afresh and again, or maybe for the first time, there is someone above and beyond, and my life should be dedicated to him because he's the one who has power over the things that normally would crush and destroy us, but not over him. The supernatural power of Jesus displayed in this story, what's it intending to do? To compel us to trust him as Savior and Lord. These miracles banish the nagging doubt that Jesus was just an ordinary man, that his gospel was a man-made story, and that doubt led people to mistrust his messengers and to deny his full identity. It's a fantastic story Peter's been telling. There's a man who was God, he died on a cross, condemned as a criminal, but he rose from the grave and he offers salvation to anyone who will repent and believe and he will return to judge the living and the dead and all of human history centers around his glory and the establishment of his church. And Peter is saying, this is the one you must believe in, but people are gripped by their sort of natural doubt and what we see is what is. And so Peter breaks into their world and proclaims again, no, this one that can save this man from paralysis and this woman from death, he lives and he is active and he invites you to trust him today. And this passage is intending to do the same thing to us. It, it, it intends to compel us. Acts is not merely given to us to pass Bible history class. Who was Aeneas? Aeneas was the paralyzed man uh, rescued by Peter in Acts chapter 9. No, that's not the point of the story. The point is to compel our hearts toward a supernatural Savior, to trust Him, functionally to trust Him, actually to trust Him, day by day to trust Him, to turn to Him actively in faith and confidence. Yes, if, if you're here and you've, you don't know Jesus as your Savior and maybe you've grown up in the church or maybe you're just visiting or something on a Sunday, yes, if, if you've never known him, let this book compel you towards him. There is actually a person who has power over death. There is actually a person who has power over the grave. There is actually a person who can take you out of your grave and if you trust in him, one day he will. Maybe not in a, a short-term resurrection like this, but ultimately, when you close your eyes in death, there is one who can raise you out of that grave again and bring you to himself so that you meet him in the eternity of his joy and glory. 
That, that's the point of the Bible, that you can come to know God and live forever with him because God has come to earth and took on the form of a man and was punished for sinners and because of their sin so that their punishment should be paid for and they can be resurrected to live forever with him, guilt-free and loved and chosen and cherished. And that's the good news of the Bible. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, which takes faith because this is out of the ordinary, this is supernatural. But if you believe in that supernatural Savior, he will lift you out of the grave one day and take you to be with him as well. It's good news. But even for Christians... We need the power of God's word in stories like this to break in to the kind of naturalistic doubt that grips us and pulls and tugs at us on a day-to-day -day basis. You can claim to believe in a supernatural savior and live your life based on natural doubt on a day-to-day -day basis. You can profess faith that Jesus is Lord over the living and the dead and that he is the one uh, that all things belong to him and that he has ultimate power and glory. And yet on a day-to-day -day basis, on Monday night or Tuesday morning or Friday afternoon, life is very natural. It's, it's, it's tugged at by, by doubts. R recently, I went with some uh, friends to a lake and um, we, we were out there on the water, and at one point I was in the water, and they were in a boat, and I was sort of swimming, trying to get towards the boat, and I realized there was some sort of a, a I don't know what lakes have, there's a current or, or some movement of the water somehow, and it's sort of pushing against me. And I'm realizing, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make very good progress right now. I, it just so happened that I was going cross current somehow, and I'm I'm, I'm pulling, but I'm not making a lot of progress through the water. I really had to put my head down, and I'm thinking, this is the thing. It's tugging me. It's pulling me backwards. Well, the opposite thing was the case. Once the boat came, and they throw the rope out, and the boat starts poke pulling, well, that boat has no problem pulling me through that water. I'm just moving through the water, no problem. Well, on my own, there's a, there's a sort of a current. It was... It was, it was pulling me. It was tugging me. And I'm not like Mr. Olympian swimmer. I was trying, but it was tugging me away. Our doubt is like that. Doubt is like a, a current in our hearts. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a tidal wave all the time. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's just like a current. It just tugs us. A, a kind of subtle, day-to-day, Monday-morning, at work, finishing the assignment, typing the email, finishing some laundry, thinking about our budget. It just kind of, here's, here's naturalistic doubt. And it just pushes us little by little. And yeah, we, we don't want to explicitly deny or doubt the supernatural existence of Jesus Christ or the reality of a heavenly being that's the center of our purpose. We wouldn't explicitly deny him, but the, but the functional center of our life tends to be affected by doubt. And before we know it, we're, we're at a great distance from a kind of a, a revivalistic confidence in Jesus Christ. It's just tugging at us. And we need the word of God and the evidence of Jesus in that word to pull us through that doubt and to direct us towards him. I'm going to give three types of doubt, three currents of doubt that I think direct us away from the Lord and that this passage with its evidence of the supernatural nature of Jesus Christ drawing us to him, turning us to him should pull us through those waves of doubt. There's three currents of doubt. I want to identify them so that you can know if they are affecting you and you can latch on to that rope of the good news of this passage that Jesus is supernatural, that he is the Savior, that he does live and direct his affairs on earth and over the church and that he is worth trusting. You can latch on to that rope and let that engine of gospel good news tug you through these currents of doubt. Three currents of doubt. First, the current of naturalism. 
Naturalism is a focus on this natural world with a functional, a functional exclusion of a supernatural God. Now, very few Christians would deny a supernatural Savior explicitly. But functionally, our focus day to day is on the natural progression of this world. Work, school, play, entertainment, sin management, religious duties. These are all what captures our attention on a day-to-day -day basis. Things happen because you do them. Things don't happen because you don't do them. This world progresses along a certain natural order, and gradually that begins to be my focus. Certainly, going to church and being a part of a gospel community or a part of that world, maybe occasionally affirming the truth about Jesus and God, but there is very little turning to the Lord on a daily basis. See, if you can recognize this current of doubt in your heart, it's very subtle. It's not a tidal wave. It just means on a day-to-day -day basis, your thoughts or my thoughts are not on Jesus, the supernatural Savior. They are on the next thing we have to do and the next natural progression of life. I'm getting older. I have to go to the doctor. There's work to be done. There's a bill to pay. There's a child to feed. And, and, and gradually, gradually, Jesus drifts from our thoughts. We need this passage to bring him back and to pull us forward that this kind of naturalistic, naturally minded way of thinking doesn't pull us away from him. <coughs> this passage intends to interrupt the current of naturalism and compel our hearts towards a personal faith in Jesus. Even if you're a Christian, Christians need to study verse 35 and verse 42. All the residents turned to the Lord. Let's ask ourselves this question. Am I consistently, functionally, practically turning to the Lord? That's what this passage is designed to do. And even if you've already confessed faith in him, you need to do that. I need to do that. I turn to a thousand natural things because naturalistic way of thinking is my way of life. I'm tired. I need natural entertainment or ease. I'm worried. I need a natural solution. I have a job to do. I need natural strength. And gradually, the naturalism kind of doubt weighs us in and confines us. And rather than turning to the Lord, we turn to natural things. Current of naturalism. Second current, the current of fatalism. Current of fatalism. Now, this is like naturalism, but it tends to have a much more apathetic view of life. What will be, will be. It doesn't matter too much what you decide to do because life is already set. This type of doubt can masquerade as faith. It can masquerade as faith. A, a fatalist functions in the natural world with a kind of a, a indifferent, apathetic view of life. They're not often anxious. They're not often passionate. They can seem peaceful and faith-filled, but they are not. What's going to happen is going to happen. It doesn't really matter much what you do. It masquerades as faith, but it is devoid of personal trust, of turning to the Lord. It seems calm, but it substitutes resignation for reliance <coughs> and apathy for affection. It seems calm, but it substitutes resignation for reliance and apathy for affection. Notice there, the action that takes place here at the end of these passages. They turn to the Lord. They believe in the Lord. Christian, Christian, we must do that still throughout our Christian life. We must turn to the Lord. We must believe in the Lord. How many times when I'm going through my days and I'm, I'm struggling with this kind of fatalistic doubt, well, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter what I do anyway. I don't understand why people get all worked up about everything. Nothing to be anxious about. There's only so much you can do. There's a sort of apathetic calm, but it's not the same thing as personal, devotional, desperate turning to the Lord, believing in the Lord. And that's the point of this passage. Look, Jesus is real and he's all powerful and he's the center of the universe and we should turn to him. Not because it means all of our troubles will be gone, but because he is the solution for our souls as we walk through the murky waters of this doubting world. 
current of fatalism. It, it, it tugs at us. It's at work trying to keep us from turning to the Lord. We need the engine of passages like this to reveal Jesus and to pull us through those waters. No, it's about Jesus. It's, it's about turning to the Lord. He really is the most exciting, most powerful, most worthy pursuit I can have right now. I need to turn to him. Finally, the current of bitterness. This is somewhat like fatalism, but it's more driven by an angry cynicism and self-pity. My life is hard. Nothing makes sense. In spite of all I've done, things turned out badly. I did my best, and it's never enough. Nobody appreciates me. This current demands answers instead of contenting itself with worship. It demands answers instead of contenting itself with worship. This is the current that, towards the end of his trial, Job began to find himself in. You must answer me. You must tell me why. And God's answer was, I give you myself, and that must be enough. And for the residents of Lydda and Sharon and Joppa, knowing who Jesus was, was enough. You notice there is no answer to the question, why Dorcas? Why not somebody else? Why eight years? Why eight years for Aeneas? Why not less time? Couldn't Jesus have healed him at any time? Why eight years of suffering and all the consequential suffering of others, maybe in his family and community? Why? Why? And instead of turning to the Lord, bitterness becomes a regular companion. This current demands answers instead of contenting itself with worship. They turned to the Lord, not because he had all the answers to give them, but because he was more worthy than the self-pity and hopelessness that bitterness cages people in. The current of bitterness turns to replaying life's wrongs rather than turning to the crucified and risen Savior. It focuses on self rather than focusing on Jesus. My friends, the readers of, of Luke's book, Acts, face these same kinds of doubts. At the end of the day, all of these currents just flow out of a functional doubt in the supernatural trustworthiness of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. And so they deceive and they tug and they pull, but they're all finally drawing us away from our confidence in him as Savior and Lord and supernatural divine son ruling over the affairs of this world and bringing all things to its final glorious conclusion and trusting in him as our Savior and trusting in the gospel message as our hope. All doubt ultimately just pushes us away from God. So whether it's naturalism and just looking at life through natural lenses day by day or it's fatalism and saying it's pointless what you do, it doesn't matter or it's bitterness and saying my life's been hard and I've been done wrong and I need answers right now. All of those doubts really are just pushing us, tugging us, leading us away from turning to the Lord. And so we need this passage to tug us back. Let the Bible tug you back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was convicted personally recently about how many times when I'm facing something difficult in life, I compensate by natural solutions or ease or distractions. And I don't recognize I need the Bible. The Bible is like the boat. It tugs me towards the Lord. This story, it tugs me towards Jesus. Oh, there's something much, much better, much more satisfying. It's turning to the Lord. It's believing in him like they did. And this story is given to us to tug us away from that doubt that looks to find anything as a savior rather than Jesus. The supernatural power of Jesus 
it compels us to trust him as Savior and Lord, to trust his gospel. It's true. It's valuable. It's life-changing. It's supernatural. He is worth it and worthy and should be the focus of our souls. And he is the antidote to the drift of doubt that can grab, gradually draw us towards the shore of despair. The supernatural power of Jesus revealed in this man, Aeneas, and in this woman, Tabitha, raised to life it draws us to trust him. It's authenticating Peter at a crucial moment when he's about to be a spokesman to the Gentile world for the first time. It's true what Peter's saying about Jesus. Jesus is real. And all unbelievers and believers should put their trust in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the good news of this story, that there is a supernatural Savior. We thank you for the joy that gives us. We thank you for the way it, it draws our heart to you. It compels us towards you. Lord, help us to do what these brothers and sisters, and Lydda and Sharon and Joppa did. Help us to turn to the Lord. Help us to identify the currents of doubt in our heart. Help us to turn to you in belief and faith and trust. Draw our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.